Oh, I need recording. <laughs> and you can, okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for having me tonight. And thank you for agreeing to do this um, over Zoom. Uh, I am going to be talking about Francis Ellen Watkins Harper from the perspective as, of um, being on the staff of the Historical Commission. Um, but uh, I'm also gonna talk about the Historical Commission's role in um, designating historic resources, um, specifically what it's doing currently to sort of um, attempt to recognize these uh, under-recognized communities uh, going forward. So first, let me just minimize this. Um, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, I only came to know of her more recently, um, but she was so many things. And uh, the things you see on your screen here, lecturer, novelist, abolitionist, social activist, poet, suffragist, educator, essayist, reformer, she was a mom, she was a, a wife, um, but for someone who I think many of us um, are only beginning to learn about, when she passed away in 1911, there were, her obituary was um, published throughout the United States. Uh, and in many of the listings, in many of the obituaries, it, it had this quote, it said that, uh, that of Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, it's been said that she has done more for her race than any other woman. So it's that's just kind of a setup as to who we're going to be talking about. Um, and it's, it's kind of fascinating then that I think many of us maybe were unaware of, of Francis until more recently. But to kind of take a step back as to why I'm giving this talk, uh, because there are other individuals who are certainly uh, very familiar with, with Francis. Um, it, it comes back to this building at 1006 Bainbridge Street. Uh, which is uh, Bainbridge, I'm sure everyone in this talk knows this, but it's um, just south of South Street and this building's between uh, 10th and 11th. Um, and it was constructed about 1845 and owned by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper from 1871 to her passing in 1911. It was listed uh, on the National Historic Landmark in 1976 and then listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places in 2021. And so that's the, um, that's the nomination that I wrote, the 2021 nomination to list it on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places. And I just wanted to um, briefly talk about this historic marker that's uh, out front of her home, because I think it's important that everyone understands sort of what these markers are, but also what they're not. Um, the reason why the Historical Commission staff decided to nominate this property as historic and listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places is because it's really the only mechanism for um, ensuring that the building um, can't be demolished. And of course, there are uh, exceptions to that rule. Um, there's, you know, there's a financial hardship provision in the preservation ordinance, but you know, by and large, a property that's listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places cannot be demolished. Um, a property that has one of these signs, these historic markers from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission out front, they can be demolished. And there's nothing preventing their demolition. Uh, but for a listing on the Philadelphia Register. And so this marker specifically was part of a 1991 through 92 initiative um, to provide 74 markers at locations throughout Philadelphia that were significant uh, to Black history in terms of recognizing the people and the places and the institutions. Um, now that, uh, that was, you know, kind of an interesting learn that I think when you go around and you if you do see some of these markers and they're associated with black history, take a look at the, like the small date on the bottom right corner because I think you'll see a lot of them uh, do date to this, um, this initiative from the early 1990s. Uh, and then just very briefly, what a nomination is to the Philadelphia Register, it's a form, but then beyond the form, it's basically a research paper making the argument for significance for um, a resource. And so in this case, the significance that we argued for was just its association with um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, not anything about the architecture uh, or anything like that. And so when you put together a nomination to designate a property as historic, you get to kind of go back through the history of the property um, and learn, kind of figure out what alterations have occurred over time. And sometimes you can learn some really interesting things. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find 
like truly historic photos. I do not, I'm not willing to call these photos from the 70s and 80s historic. <laughs> um, but what we do learn when you go through the photos and you uh, go through the zoning archive is that, and the building permit abstract that we happen to have um, access to in our office for this property specifically was that in 1923, the buildings listed as vacant and they are going to install a storefront uh, so that it's a, a new use as a store and a tenement dwelling above as it's referred to. So we know that by 1923, that's the status of this building. And then we know that this 1976 photo shows that the storefront had been infilled. Um, and a 1982 zoning document tells us that there was five units with, in this building and they shared bathrooms on each floor. Uh, and that at that time, they were looking to reduce it down to two units, which is what I think it is today. Um, and then in 1987, the owner um, uh, decided that they wanted to undertake an initiative to sort of try to bring it back to its historic appearance. There wasn't much left um, in terms of the actual facade materials. Uh, the cornice was believed to have potentially been original, uh, but beyond that, there was not too much in, except for the overall massing and form and fenestration of the upper floors. So, you know, it brought us to where we are today to this uh, current appearance. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of talk you through how, how, we, <laughs> how we kind of approach the nomination in terms of the history of the building and, um, and, but that's just the physical part, right? So then we need to research the, you know, the other, the significance associated with the individual. Um, but I first wanted to pivot to talk about the Philadelphia Historical Commission um, and sort of what the commission's currently doing to uh, better recognize, to acknowledge that it hasn't done the best job um, recognizing historic resources associated with underserved communities such as the black and brown and LGBTQ communities. And then sort of what, what's been happening over the past few years. And then also um, sort of where we're going. Uh, so I thought before we talk about Francis, um, I could just very quickly run through slides of properties I, that we've designated, that the Historical Commission has designated as historic and listed on the Philadelphia Register of Historic Places just over the past few years. Like, so I'm not even going back very far in time here um, that are associated with Black history specifically. Um, and uh, there's nominations written for all of these. So if you ever wanted to learn more about one of the sites, uh, these are all available on our website and I can always direct you to that. Um, but so I'm just gonna hit some of these as, as we go along uh, and just very briefly tell you what the association is for the significance um, associated with uh, black history. So first is a very recent designation of a historic district, Christian Street, uh, Black Doctors Row Historic District. This is 154 properties um, on Christian Street, west of Broad, uh, between Broad and South 20th, um, that uh, represents the history of Christian Street from uh, the 1860s through uh, 1945, when uh, this area was associated with some of Philadelphia's black elite, some being doctors, others being uh, politicians, other professionals. Um, we have the Sadie T.M. Alexander House and Raymond Pace Alexander House at 700 Westview Avenue. This was just recently designated too, um, out in East Falls. Uh, the civil rights pioneers, uh, Sadie T.M. Alexander and her husband, uh, Raymond Pace Alexander, they purchased uh, this property in 1959 and uh, lived there. Um, well, Raymond Pace Alexander passed away while they were there and then um, Sadie uh, moved out just before her passing. So they had lived here in their later years. Uh, we have 919 to 21 Lombard Street, the Smith Whipper Houses, uh, former residents, former residences of important African-American abolitionists, reformers, businessmen and civic uh, activists, Stephen and Harriet Smith and William and Harriet Whipper. And we've got 1102 Master Street, another one that was just recently designated, uh, the sister Rosetta Tharp House. Uh, she lived here from 1962 to 1973 and she was known as uh, one of gospel music's first superstars. A very like unassuming architecturally, you know, house. So it's not something that you'd otherwise maybe think of an association for historic designation, but these are the types of sites we're trying to um, bring recognition to. Uh, we have 1651 Kinsey Street, 
Uh, so this one's actually, there's two designations here. The church itself, the Campbell AME Church of Frankfurt, this was actually uh, an earlier designation in, from 1982, but then the site itself, which is a cemetery, uh, a burial ground, just to the side of the church and somewhat underneath the church, um, associated with black history, uh, uh, that was just designated recently owing to its archeological potential. 1901 West Oxford Street, uh, this was a, a building that the city of Philadelphia built in 1908 as a police station, but in 1964, uh, the Reverend Leon Sullivan, who was a civil rights leader, converted the building for use as the Opportunities Industrialization Center, the OIC, which played a significant role in the civil rights movement. And you can see uh, he's, uh, he's in that photo shaking hands with uh, LBJ. Uh, we have uh, 5626 Morton Street out in Germantown. This is the Sun Ra House. Um, Sun Ra, among, among other things, was um, a poet, author, composer, actor, philosopher, mystic, uh, founder of the Afrofuturism movement, uh, one of the most influential jazz musicians of the 20th century. Uh, he and some of his band members lived and rehearsed in this house starting in 1968. Um, and he passed away in 1993, but some of his band members still live there and still, uh, still play at the Rojas. 1016 to 18 South Street, uh, another recent designation, Engine 11 Firehouse, uh, which from 1919 to 1952 was one of only two African-American fire companies in the segregated Philadelphia Fire Department, uh, which was desegregated segregated in 1953. Um, another designation recent is uh, the Pyramid Club at 1517 West Gerard. Uh, this was home to the Pyramid Club from 1940 to 1965. The club was founded uh, by prominent members of the Black community, um, and it fostered and encouraged uh, and gave expression to civic, social, and cultural opportunities uh, for African Americans, which were denied to them by other organizations in the area. 1801 Meadow Street, the Free Burying Ground of Frankfurt. This is actually also two designations on Kind of one site. So the burial ground itself um, in the black and white photo is contained within the white fenced area. Uh, it's now a playground, uh, the Wilmot Park playground. But um, we uh, recently designated, the Historical Commission recently designated that site um, for the association with the free public burying ground. There's really no record of um, disinterment of the um, black individuals who are buried there. Uh, and then the school itself that you see there in the historic photo, um, this was designated back in 2016, and that's the Wilmot Public School, which was intended specifically and exclusively for the education of Black children. The Pearl Valley House at 1946 North 23rd Street uh, was the family home of actress and singer Pearl Bailey, who described it in her autobiography as the house where her career started. Uh, 5706 Germantown Avenue is associated with John S. Trower. Uh, he was a caterer, businessman, philanthropist, uh, real estate investor, and restaurateur. And he was locally and then also nationally uh, significant. This is out in Germantown, obviously. Uh, Sigma Sound Studios at 210 to 12 North 12th Street. This is a really fun nomination to read if, you, if you're interested um, in this, in music history. Um, this was home to Sigma Sound Studios, one of the most influential recording studios in America in the late 20th century, and the birthplace of the Sound of Philadelphia or Philly Soul. Pretty unassuming building um, now, but <laughs> has quite a history to it. Uh, 807 to 11 Bainbridge Street and 620 to 24 South 8th Street. These buildings uh, were until I think very recently connected uh, at their rears. Uh, this was the Church of the Crucifixion and Parish House and associated with Archdeacon Henry L. Phillips, who began his ministry in 1877 and turned uh, the Church of the Crucifixion into a leader for social outreach uh, in the surrounding Black community. And it was um, an early provider of shelter and refuge for some of the city's poorest Black residents who were able to benefit from the church's mission work. Almost done with this list but I just think it's important to highlight these. <laughs> uh, 915 to 25 Bainbridge Street. This is uh, the Institute for Colored Youth. 
uh, now I think condos. Um, and this was one of the first schools to train uh, Blacks for skilled trades and teaching. And um, this location is about a block from the Francis Ellen Watkins Harper House. And then I'm gonna end here with the more recent designations associated with Black history. This is 625 South Delhi Street, the William and Letitia Still House, um, which is right next to the Institute for Colored Youth or kind of adjacent to it. And um, this was a, a property, I should say, because Delhi is a north-south little small side, side street. So it's, um, if you know where the Whole Foods is on South Street, it's kind of like right there. <laughs> so in between, uh, south and Bainbridge, and then in between um, 9th and 10th. Uh, so William and Letitia still rented this house for five years, uh, from 1850 to 1855, and it was used as an underground uh, uh, way station. And we're going to come back to this, but the reason I'm ending on this one is uh, this was a designation from a few years ago uh, that was, um, I believe, sort of an undocumented site until the nomination was written um, by uh, Jim Duffin and Oscar Beiser. And uh, I don't think it was until that, until sort of that research was done for this nomination, I don't think it was understood that this, that that's what this property, that, that that was associated with this property for five years during an incredibly important time. Uh, and it represents the African-American abolitionist businessman leader on the Underground Railroad historian, writer, and civil rights activist, uh, William Still. And it served as an important stop for enslaved people as they passed through Philadelphia and sought freedom. And so I am going to then pivot now back to Frances Ellen Watkins Harper because she was very close friends with William Still. And I have to believe that, well, I think, Personally, I think her choice of location for her, her home at 1006 Bainbridge Street being, you know, a block from here, this was an area that she knew because I think she, I believe she stayed here in this home when she was staying with the stills. And so it would have been a familiar neighborhood to her when she came back to Philadelphia and, and was looking um, to purchase property. So Frances Ellen Watkins, uh, to, to switch completely to her, she was born in Baltimore to free black parents, um, but Baltimore, or, but Maryland was a slave state. Um, so, but she ended up being raised by her aunt and uncle because she was orphaned by the age of three. Um, and so her uncle was William Watkins. And this is like really critical to Francis's development and who, kind of who she became because William Watkins was an outspoken abolitionist. He uh, organized a black literary society and he established the Watkins Academy for Negro Youth, which Frances attended until she was 13 years old. So she was getting an education. She was, you know, a black female getting an education when, when other children were, you know, even white children were not getting an education. And she was surrounded by um, sort of this, this uh, environment of, um, you know, of this anti, you know, anti-slavery, uh, the importance of literature and the importance of education. So I think that really, you know, kind of shaped who she became. So she's, she's pretty impressive in this. <laughs> she's in her early twenties and she has her first publication um, as, a, as a black female at this time. It's a collection of 20 poems called Forest Leaves. Uh, there's a little debate uh, among researchers as to exactly the, the year that it was first published. It had actually been missing um, until uh, a student was working on a dissertation and found it at the Maryland Historical Society, um, a copy of, it, well, this copy of it. And so there's, it, I mean, it was sometime in the late 1840s that she published this. And it's more or less like a pamphlet. Um, but this was her first published work. and. William Still, who goes on to publish a very um, incredible book about the Underground Railroad later in 1872, says this about her work to kind of give you an idea what she's up against at this time and going forward. It was that, quote, the ability exhibited in some of her productions was so, so remarkable that some doubted and others denied their originality. So here she is, you know, she's, 
she's writing her poems. She's, she gets to publish them and she's, you know, being doubted. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, it doesn't dissuade her, but she does decide she needs to, you know, pick up a job that's going to give her some money. So she goes to Ohio. And she becomes a, a teacher at Union Seminary. She's the first Black female teacher there. Uh, she doesn't stay there too long. She then moves on to York, Pennsylvania, uh, also teaching there. And she, in York, she witnessed the activities of the Underground Railroad, um, which helped launch her involvement in anti-slavery causes. But more, more than that, this law passed in 1853. And I remember she's from Maryland, and Maryland enacted this law uh, forbidding free Blacks from the North from entering the state from the northern border. So she's basically in exile now. She can't go home, right? She can't go to her home state. And what happened is uh, there was, there's a story she writes about later of a free Black man who you know, unknowingly broke this law, was sold into slavery in Georgia, escaped, um, and then died from exposure and suffering. And she wrote to a friend that uh, in a letter that she, she said that, that upon that grave, I pledged myself to the anti-slavery cause. So this is really the start of her saying, this is what I'm gonna do. Also in that same letter, or a, I guess a, a letter around the same time, she's writing to a friend and is basically saying how maybe teaching isn't for her, like teaching little kids. She wants to teach, she wants to educate. But um, a bunch of little kids running around uh, apparently isn't, isn't what she's really set on doing. So back to the Stills house, um, she, you know, she's, she's friends with the Stills. They're, they're lifelong friends um, because they're friends with her uncle, William Watkins. And the Stills rented this property from 1850 to 55, like I said. Um, and more recently, it's been documented as an underground railroad way station. And she stayed with the stills in the early to mid 1850s. And I know that, um, you know, there was the, the anti-slavery society building where the mint is now. Um, but uh, I, and I, and I know that it's said that she um, visited there and, and read all, you know, all the literature that was to be read there. But um, given that this was a place where they housed people, I think it's probably likely that she stayed here too. And, um, and that that, you know, kind of, led her back to this area uh, in later years. So William Still publishes this book in 1872 called The Underground Railroad. Um, and this is, I mean, maybe, maybe everyone here has already read this. I'm just preaching to the choir, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. And it has 26 pages dedicated to telling Francis, Watkins Francis Allen Watkins Harper's story. And because he chose to publish so many of the private letters that she wrote to him, it gives us this great insight into who she was and what she was up to and what she was thinking um, that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And he even admits, he's like, these weren't really meant for, you know, these weren't meant to be shared, but he does. Um, and I kind of, I, I, I love that because it allows us to, to really understand um, where she's at. And I would say that, you know, if you, if you want to be exposed to sort of exactly her mindset, just look at those 26 pages at the very end of the book um, to, to really get a, a sense of her. Um, and let's see. So moving on to back to her literature. So at this time, so Frances, she's, she's writing and she's publishing, but she's also lecturing. So she's traveling around um, and because uh, she's hired as a traveling lecturer by the Anti-Slavery Society of Maine. So she's traveling throughout New, New England and Canada at this time because this is you know, pre-Civil War. Um, so uh, so she's, she's doing the traveling. She, sorry, I'm, I'm making sure I hit everything on this slide. <laughs> okay, so around this time, she's, she publishes another uh, pamphlet, which is called Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects. Um, and the topics that she covers in this, in her, poetry in, in this specific um, pamphlet. She's talking about um, slavery, gender, religion, temperance, and poverty, like all, she's touching on all these heavy subjects, um, but it's been, it was reprinted 20 times and she sold thousands of copies. So she was able to donate portions of the sales to the Underground Railroad. And actually, if you 
if you look back in William Still's book and you read her letters, she's in a in a lot of the letters she's talking about you know the small amount of money that she's enclosing uh, for him for the Underground Railroad uh, cause. And some, you know, one letter, it's $2. Another letter, I think it was like $30, which is like, that was, that was probably a decent amount of money. Um, <laughs> and that's because she's, so she's giving these lectures. She's, she's highly sought after, right after this publication, this was like really what launched her um, as a known name at the time. Uh, so she's not charging for the lectures that she's giving um, to individuals. Maybe, I, I would hope that, you know, if she's being asked to, um, you know, speak at an event. Hopefully she's maybe getting um, some sort of compensation there, but they take up collections basically when she's um, doing a lecture uh, on, um, you know, elevating the race and, and the importance of education, um, they're passing around a collection tin for her. And that's sort of how she's making her money. So then she goes on to uh, publish the first short story by an African-American woman in the United States called The Two Offers. Um, and this, the, the story itself is basically two cousins discussing um, two marriage proposals uh, and discussing sort of the, the pros and cons of each one. Um, and so kind of interesting timing in the sense that, that she publishes this in 1859. And then in 1860, the following year, she gets married um, in Ohio to a farmer. So Fenton Harper was a widower and a farmer and had three children uh, that he brought to the relationship. And then together they had one, Mary. Um, and so they get married in 1860 in Ohio and Francis basically then stops touring and decides like this is, you know, this is her new lot in life. She's a mother, she's a homemaker. Um, but what happens is Fenton passes away in, in 1864. So the relationship doesn't end up lasting that long. And she, then what she speaks of in a, in a future lecture is that um, he left her in debt. So he, he, when he passed, he had no money. Um, and then she has these four kids, you know, one of her own, three of his, um, and the state takes the farm and takes everything. And so she's then off again, trying to figure out, you know, what she's going to do, how she's going to make money and support her family. It sounds like she, uh, got the three kids of Fenton's to live with the, um, her in-laws. So, you know, that's taken care of. <laughs> and then Mary, her, you know, her biological, uh, daughter, stays with her. Um, and so she goes back out onto the lecture circuit. Uh, so and post-Civil War then, she starts lecturing in the South, um, except two states, <laughs> she says, uh, Texas and Arkansas are the two states she's, she's not talking in. <laughs> but she's warned that it's dangerous. And she's still going. I mean, she's, when you read her letter, she's away for this is year, years where she's, you know, I spoke tonight at this place. I spoke last night at this. I spoke twice today. I, you know, I lectured to an audience of both black and white people and she's really well received and she doesn't seem to be scared off by any, any warnings of, you know, that it could be dangerous for her depending on where she is down South. Um, but she talks about the importance of uh, being self-sufficient and specifically um, owning property if you can. Now that, you know, now that you, if you're not, if you're no longer, a, you know, a slave and you can own property, she speaks of the importance of this um, so that you have something that you can, you can rely on. Uh, and so it's interesting then that I think she, at some point she needs to decide where she's really going to set up shop, right? <laughs> um, because when she's lecturing, she's just staying at different places offered to her by the people who are asking her to speak. Um, so in 1871, she decides to come back to Philadelphia and she buys this property at 1006 Bainbridge. She pays $2,266.67, <laughs> very specific. Um, but it's interesting because I think we've, you know, we all, we know this is the Francis Allen Watkins Harper house, but when you look at the census records, 
she's never here in that snapshot of time uh, once every 10 years on, at a very specific moment. Um, and I think it's because she's always out touring. She's, she's on this lecture circuit still for years. And so I think she, you know, she has this as her home base, as her headquarters, but she's running it out. Um, and she's running it out to friends and family, it seems. So uh, in the 18, so she buys it in 1871. In the 1880 census, her daughter Mary is renting the property, is listed as being rented, renting the property um, with Mary's husband and uh, one daughter. And then uh, the 1890 census, we, you know, we don't have that. Uh, the 1900 census then shows that a widowed Mary, her daughter is now widowed and is renting the property and she's got five children. Um, and then the 1910 census, which for reasons that I'll get to in a couple of slides, we know Francis wasn't living at this physical place. Um, it shows that it's being rented to uh, a Henrietta and Lucinda Johnson, which are, is a, um, it, seems to be a black mother daughter uh, uh, you know, pairing from what I can tell from the census records. And I suspect there may be some um, friendship or otherwise relationship there. And um, so I don't doubt that Frances used this home when she was in Philadelphia, um, given that it had so many rooms, um, but it's, in, it's just interesting that when we go back and we look at the, you know, the official every 10 year documentation of who's here, it's not her, <laughs> but it is people associated with her. And we do know from the deeds that she did truly own this property for those, you know, those 40 years. Um, and then just to, to kind of give a sense of the neighborhood, because, you know, we, we're looking at this photo here and it's, we know, we know this, um, but from around Francis's time being there, and this is from 1918, so a little after she passed away, but this is across the street. Uh, this is a, a a building across the street that the um, the caption says it's a five room house now a tenement, um, and then the caption also says one result of the present housing shortage uh, from Temple Urban Archives, and then a block away this is another view this is a Bainbridge Street between um, 11th and 12th again from after Francis is passing but to try to give a sense of sort of this neighborhood that she you know that she was in, um, so. She goes on to then publish um, a book called Poems, different than uh, uh, Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects. So this Poems was one that was reprinted multiple times. And what I really like about this title page specifically is that she's using the 1006 Bainbridge Street address, which gives us you know, one more tie to connect her to this physical property. Um, but she spent the second half of her life and career, so she's headquartered in Philadelphia and she's advocating for equal rights, job opportunities, and education for Black women um, through her lecturing and her writing. Uh, and she uses time to publish even more collections of poetry. So she has poems, she has sketches of Southern life in 1872, which chronicles reconstruction. Um, and then she has a few others. I'm not gonna be able to, she, she did a lot of publishing and we'd be, you know, this would be a much longer talk if we, if we could delve into all of her um, pieces of writing. But one that I do wanna just talk about just very briefly is uh, Iola Leroy. So she published this novel, uh, Iola Leroy or Shadows Uplifted in 1892. Um, and this is considered to be one of the first novels published by a black woman in the United States. So again, she's just, you know, adding to her significance as we know it now, as um, someone who's extremely significant in in literature, in the field of literature, I mean, not even counting, <laughs> not even counting her being a black female. Um, but so Iola Leroy tells the story of uh, the struggles of being orphaned, searching for work, experiencing racism, um, and it weaved together these issues of racism, sexism, and classism in ways that they hadn't really been recognized truly yet as like intersecting issues. 
And in case you thought like maybe she was like taking it easy and not doing much, um, she was involved in so many organizations. Uh, and just to kind of like highlight a few, during the second half of her career, she's co-founder and vice president of the National Association of Colored Women Clubs. She's director of the American Association of Colored Youth. She's superintendent of the colored sections of the Philadelphia and Pennsylvania Women's Christian Temperance Unions. Um, and then also you'll see down at the very bottom, the First Unitarian Church during the years that she uh, was here in Philadelphia. Um, it's interesting, I, uh, she chose to join an integrated church rather than one of the many African-American churches that were you know, options at the time nearby. Um, and apparently it's because the Unitarian Church aligned more with her views on equality for women. So that was, I mean, it, it's not to say, so she's still, she was still a lifetime member of the AME church. She still apparently um, participated in educating their Sunday school classes, but for her own um, purposes, she, she chose the Unitarian Church. And then, uh, so this is interesting. And, and one that, I mean, I'm not sure how significant it is, but for, um, I wanted to bring it up because we're, you know, this is tour guides and tour guides, I assume, would like places, like physical places to, to know about. Um, so in the Mantua neighborhood, she purchased another row house uh, in 1894 um, at 775 North 37th Street. And I only know of this because of her will. It's in, it's in her will, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides, but um, there's no documentation to show she ever lived here. I don't, I don't think she did, but her daughter Mary um, was living here when, when Mary passed away in 1908 at age 46. So she passed away pretty, um, pretty early. She passed away two years before Francis did. Um, but so it seems, it seems like she purchased this to give Mary and presumably her children a place to live on their own. Um, and so kind of incredible that, um, you know, a black woman uh, owning all of, the, all of this property, she owned these two properties. And it turns out, uh, according to our will, she also had land in Ohio still, um, which I think it seemed like maybe uh, based on, you know, the research that was already done, it sounded like maybe uh, that sort of, that land had been taken away when Fenton passed. But it, uh, based on her will, it sounds like she may have still actually had it. <laughs> so she's, you know, she's um, advocating for the importance of being self-sufficient and sort of being an independent person, being able to like, you know, you don't have to rely on someone else. And she's, she's making all these moves to kind of ensure that that's how she can live her life. So in terms of other places, uh, 1507 Pine Street, which is behind the tree here, um, two years before she passed, this is where she was living, according to her will. Um, so she, uh, I, I would have to assume that since her daughter had just recently passed, so she didn't have her daughter to help her maybe, you know, and, and I know that um, Francis was complaining, not complaining, but speaking of, um, you know, her body starting to fail her and, and she, you know, she was obviously, you know, getting older, much older at this time. And so perhaps she ended up moving in here with someone who was able to sort of do some caretaking for her. And then unfortunately, two years later, uh, she passed away in 1911 um, and she was staying with her cousin at the time at 1809 Lombard Street, which unfortunately is a stretch of row homes that were demolished years ago. Um, but she deeded her, she gave her cousin both of her properties. Um, that's what this, says here, <laughs> and also all of her wearing apparel and household effects. Uh, and then she goes on to, you know, donate a little bit of money to certain um, local organizations that she wants to support, uh, in addition to um, a few cousins that she has remaining. But other than that, she doesn't actually have, if you think about it, she was an only child. Um, her only daughter passed away before her, so she didn't really have uh, much uh, remaining in the way of, of you know, close family. Um, so she's buried in uh, Eden Cemetery, 
and I hear maybe I hear that maybe there will be a trip planned for this group out there. Um, but Eden Cemetery was uh, established in 1902 out in Delaware County, uh, and it was it was initially a cemetery for African Americans who had been buried in cemeteries in Philadelphia that were being condemned uh, by the city in the early 20th century. And so this was a real problem because they, you know, the, it wasn't a very respectful way of these bodies were being, were going to be treated. So this um, cemetery opens outside of the city um, because there's also, you know, some legislation passed in the city saying you can't open any new burial grounds for African-Americans. So they go outside of the city um, and to allow for the bodies that were buried in the condemned cemeteries to be disinterred and then reinterred here at Eden Cemetery. Uh, that was not the case with Frances. She was you know, directly buried here, but um, her, her grave's marked with both of these headstones. So you have the well-worn pillar on the left um, and then a more recently added um, marker on the right, which has, um, she's also buried with her daughter, Mary, you kind of see that there. Um, and the newer of the two markers is inscribed with an excerpt from Bury Me in a Free Land, um, which is one of her most well-known poems. Um, and it just has the, the last four lines. I'll read those to you, even though I, it sounds like we're gonna hear that poem um, after this, which is great. But I just, I wanna just make the association with the burial and, um, and why it's, you know, her epitaph is, I ask no monument proud and high to arrest the gaze of the passers-by all that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. And so that's that's the language that's on her grave marker right there. So fast forward over a hundred years, <laughs> here we are. And you know, it's a it's a really interesting kind of way that it's all happened because what you hear of Frances Sellen Watkins Harper during her lifetime is that she was actually really well known, well respected. She was sought after. Um, and then, you know, there's, um, there's a whole stretch of years where I think, you know, we don't, we don't know, like she's not being taught. She's, she's kind of dropped from the radar. And thankfully, um, I think, and, and, you know, it's the only way I heard about her is that she's, she's coming back now, right? Like we're, we're learning about individuals like Francis and, um, it's a great opportunity. I think it, it's it's so wonderful that we we get to like even have these conversations now. Um, and so one of the newer things that is sort of a even though she asked for no monument, proud and high, here's a monument, <laughs> which includes Francis Ellen Watkins Harper among uh, three other men. Uh, this is located. This is called the Gathering at the Crossroads. It was installed in 2020 uh, to as uh, because of the um, 100th and 150th um, anniversary of the um, passing of the 19th and the 15th amendments. Um, so this is located in Harrisburg's Capitol Park uh, and uh, it represents both, you know, the 15th and 19th amendments, but also the eighth ward of Harrisburg, which was historically a black community, which was completely wiped out. Um, and so this is an allegorical gathering of these uh, four individuals to commemorate a time in 1870 when the 15th Amendment, which granted uh, African-American men the right to vote, became federal law. Um, and so you have four bronze statues here. So obviously you have Francis on the right. Uh, the other three, it's Thomas Morris Chester, the first African-American war correspondent, Jacob T. Compton, uh, a pastor and musician who helped uh, President-elect Abraham Lincoln evade an assassination attempt. Um, William Howard Day, the first African-American school board president and advocate for the 15th Amendment, and then our, our Francis. Um, and I also, I heard maybe you might be making a trip out to Harrisburg, so hopefully you get to see this when you're out there. Because um, there is a lot more to this, obviously. There's, you know, the whole podium and everything that's inscribed on it, but we'd be here a really long time if we, <laughs> if we talked about all of that. Um, and then the other thing that's a new thing that's, that in, includes Francis Ellen Watkins Harper is this sculpture at the police station headquarters, the new police station headquarters in the old Inquirer building on North Broad. So this is nine feet tall. Um, 
it hangs in the window and it's a replica of a police badge uh, with the official city seal in the center. But instead of the two typical allegorical figures uh, representing peace and plenty, it uses real historical figures um, from Philadelphia. So we have uh, Lucretia Mott and then Francis Harper. Francis is on the right. Um, it's called Let Love Endure is the name of the artwork. And the, this design was a result. So this was a result of the George Floyd killing um, in 2020 and the artist's reaction to sort of what he initially thought he was going to create when he was commissioned for this artwork, which was gonna be more traditional and typical and representing these, you know, peace and plenty and these, you know, allegorical figures. And then he decided, he said, you know, he, and I'm just paraphrasing from uh, an interview that I listened to with him, but he basically, he said, you know, after the George Floyd uh, murder by police, he felt like he needed to make, he needed to change the design to kind of speak more to what was going on and, and, and to um, have this be something that police, Philadelphia police officers would see every day as they're entering and maybe consider, you know, their, their true uh, role here in the city. Um, so that's apparently at the, uh, the old Inquire building, new police headquarters on North Broad. Um, and then in terms of, in terms of Francis's legacy, I guess I would say that I encourage you to seek out other resources if you find her to be a compelling person that you wanna learn more about. We could only kind of scratch the surface tonight. She she's, has a complex life story. She's, she has so many pieces of literature that she's written um, that are worthy, well worthy of a read. And then I'd also say, you know, the nomination that I wrote to designate her property as historic was really um, a compilation of a lot of research that was already done. I feel like I brought very little new information to the table, except for maybe, you know, I didn't see anything before about the census records not showing her living there or that other property that she owned in Mantua. Um, other than that, a lot of the research was already done. A lot of it was done by, you know, Black women historians, um, Black poets. Um, and so there's, there's a lot out there for further review and reading and, and sort of digestion. And so, you know, in that vein, I would say at the top left here is a, a book called Discarded Legacy, Politics and Poetics in the Life of Francis E.W. Harper by Melba Joyce Boyd. Um, this was published back in 1994, actually. It's a really interesting account of um, Melba Joyce Boyd, who's also a, a Black female poet, um, sort of her discovering Francis and her connection, you know, that she developed with, with Francis. And a lot of historical information in there, a lot of um, excerpts from Francis's writings and sort of interpretation in, from new eyes. And then um, another uh, sort of angle that I would really encourage if you're into podcasts, it's only four episodes. I could have listened to a lot more, but this Finding Francis podcast. Um, so this is this is, was just put out this year, I think. Um, it's hosted by Kalela Williams. Um, and she's she interviews some really fascinating people who are in one way or another connected with either um, you know, researching the history of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, or are, happen, you know, are themselves Black female poets, or are, you know, Black female musicians, or um, historians. Um, so a really interesting, unfortunately, only four episodes, but um, you'll get a really wide range of perspectives then um, if by listening to that, and you can find that online or on Spotify. Um, and then just, you know, the bottom row here is, is some reprints of things that Francis Ellen Watkins Harper published that have been reprinted more recently to, to bring um, awareness to them, bring it to new readers. And then also uh, some compilations of her poetry, like A Brighter Coming Day um, is the compilation, uh, a more recently published compilation of, of her works that you can kind of read. Uh, and get a better sense of those. And then finally, I'll leave us with this. I apologize that I've gone long. <laughs> um, so 
so the the reason that I was brought here tonight to speak is being on the staff of the Philadelphia Historical Commission and authoring this this you know nomination, but bringing it back to the Historical Commission for one moment. Um, I would just uh, hope that you all keep an eye out for this cultural resources survey that's going to be starting up fairly soon. Uh, this is an initiative of the H Philadelphia Historical Commission and the larger Department of Planning and Development. And it's gonna be eventually once, once we kind of get the ball rolling on it, uh, it's William Penn Foundation funded. Um, it will be a community led process to identify, survey and document um, stories and spaces that represent Philadelphia's uh, sort of untold uh, community, like the communities that aren't currently being represented, um, but are very much a part of what we know of Philadelphia, right? So, um, and it, what it's really seeking to do is recognize that some of these stories are not marked by physical objects, right? Like they're not, they're not a Francis Ellen Watkins Harper house but they could be something like food or you know, um, a parade, uh, you know, other types of events, um, songs, uh, traditions. And so it's like, how do, you, how do you document and recognize those and protect and preserve those kinds of things too when they're not, when, you know, when there's not a physical thing to, that, that our current process allows for us to, to document and protect like the Francis Allen Watkins Harper House. So this is sort of this, um, this new initiative. It's, it's going to be a citywide survey, but it's kind of focused really heavily on these like intangible cultural resources. And so the website that's set up, um, this is not our actual historical commission website, but the website that is set up to kind of focus solely on the survey initiative is this phlpreservation.org that I put at the bottom. Um, right now, a consultant team has been brought on and they're, they're looking to, they're going to be starting like a pilot project to sort of see how this works. Um, but it's something that I think, um, just keep an eye out because there's going to be more information coming about it and hopefully ways that, you know, all Philadelphians can get involved. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kim. I think before we go to questions. Um, since Kim talks so much about all the literary works of um, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, why don't we have Trinika do her, her reading now? And just let me read you a little bit about Trinika. So Trinika Danielle has been acting since childhood. Her parents would say since birth. Oh, do you want to go ahead and um, unshare your screen, Kim? And then people can see her when she, Trinika when she's reading. Um, acting led to her writing stories as well. Her first screenplay, IEP, was aired nationally in 2012 in the African American Shorts Film Program. She is the content creator of the YouTube web series, Ladies Small Group, that ran from 2013 to 2016. In 2020, she published a children's book entitled Kingdom Kids, The Bully. Her future goals include screenwriting feature films, acting, producing, and publishing a children's book series. And she's going to be reading Bury Me in a Free Land. Make me a grave, wherever you will, in a lowly place or a lofty hill. Make it among our humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest. If around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave, his shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led, and the mother's shriek of wildest despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the last drinking her blood at each fearful gash, and I saw her babies torn from her breast like trembling doves from a parent's nest. And I shudder and start if I heard the bay of bloodhounds seizing their human prey. 
And I heard the captain plead in vain as they bowed afresh his gaggling chain. If I saw young girls from their mother's arms bartered and sold for their youthful charms, my eyes, my eye would flash with a mournful flame. My death pale cheeks grow red with shame. I would sleep. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might can rob no man of his dearest right. My rest shall be calm in any grave where none can call his brother a slave. I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of the passerby. All oh, that I, my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. That was beautiful. Thank you. Could you give us the date on the poem and where it was first published? Do you have that, Trinika? Give me one second. I don't know if it's in this one. Because this one was um, a listing. George, you're muted. Oh, he can't hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's not on this listing, but I can get it for you. Cool. Well, thank you both, Kim and Trinika. That was awesome. I like had goosebumps the entire time. <laughs> um, and then any um, questions, you can uh, raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. I'll just read one here. Um, Rick had a question. Do we know where William Still was living when Francis moved to Philly in 1871? A good question. Um, I bet that it's in the nomination for uh, 625 South, South Dell High Street. Um, but without knowing off the top of my head, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling through the nomination to see if I can find it. Um, so, okay, I will say this. It looks like in 1872, so a year after Francis moved to um, Bainbridge Street, he's listed at 244 South 12th Street. Which maybe demolished. Oh, no, not demolished. That's okay. That makes sense. So that's 244 South 12th Street is um, actually has the William Still marker out in front of it. Um, so uh, sort of before you hit Spruce Street. So in between uh, Locust and Spruce on 12th. And Carla is writing that that is next door to where she lives, 244 oh. South 12th Street. <laughs> That's great. Um, and in terms of that, the poem, uh, Bury Me in a Free Land, what I have written, what I have down about, so I believe it's from 1858 and was first published, um, written for the anti-slavery Bugle newspaper in 1858. But then, you know, re republished. Francis had she. It was interesting. I mean, and and I don't know. I'm I'm not a literary expert by any stretch. So I don't. Maybe this is commonplace. But um, apparently, she um, uh, kind of. I don't want to say she recycled poems, but she she republished some of her works in later publications and and adapted. She changed the. She changed some of the language. She would update it. She would. Um, give something a new title, um, but parts of it would be something that she had published earlier in a, 